Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stephen Toop, and I have the honor to serve as the president of the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences. I'm delighted to welcome you to this afternoon to Congress 2016's final Big Thinking Lecture. I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot and the people of the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. We have been incredibly impressed by the great preparations and delivery by our host, the Uni uh, University of Calgary, during this Congress week. And I want to take a moment for all of us to say a very warm thank you. They've done a great job. Please join me. J'aimerais aussi signaler, avant de commencer, que nous proposons un service d'interprétation simultanée. Vous pourriez vous procurer vos, des écouteurs dans la salle située à l'extérieur du théâtre. Je souhaite remercier le Conseil de recherche en sciences humaines, la Fondation canadienne pour l'innovation et Université Canada pour leur pèlerinage de la série de causeries Voir Grande. It's thanks to the generosity of these sponsors that we are able to make these events open to the public. The Big Thinking series gives us a chance to engage in conversations about the most pressing issues of our time, and today is no exception. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Jennifer Clapp, who will no doubt challenge and engage us as she discusses food security and sustainability in the context of global trade. We are welcoming Dr. Clapp through the sponsorship of the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation, an organization whose work I've long admired. Full disclosure, I was actually the founding president, but that just means that I've seen it up close and I value its work. The Trudeau Foundation is an independent and non-partisan charity established in 2001 as a memorial to the former prime minister. By granting doctoral scholarships, awarding fellowships, appointing mentors, and holding public events, the Foundation encourages critical reflection and action in four areas important to all Canadians. Human rights and dignity, responsible citizenship, Canada's role in the world, and people and their natural environment. And this makes the Trudeau Foundation a natural partner for the Federation, given the common links in our mandates to promote research in humanities and social sciences, fostering dialogue between scholars and decision makers in government and all parts of society. We're also delighted to have a Trudeau Fellow as part of our Big Thinking Lecture Series. Dr. Clapp holds a Canada Research Chair in Global Food Security and Sustainability. She's a Trudeau Fellow and a professor in the Environment and Resource Studies Department at the University of Waterloo. She received her BA in Economics from the University of Michigan and her Master's and PhD in International Relations from the London School of Economics. Dr. Clapp's research focuses on global governance, problems that arise at the intersection of the global economy, the environment, and food security. More specifically, she studies how international economic policies can foster global food security and environmental sustainability goals. She takes an interdisciplinary approach in her research, combining insights from political science, international relations, economics, environmental studies, and food studies. Her recent books include Food and Hunger in the Balance, The New Politics of International Food Aid, which was shortlisted for the 2012 Donner Prize awarded to the best public policy book in Canada. We are delighted to have Dr. Clapp with us today. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you, Stephen, for that nice introduction. And thank you, everyone, for being here uh, today. I know it's a lovely day out, and it's a dark room in here at, at lunchtime. So I appreciate you coming out to hear my talk. And as Stephen mentioned, I'm going to be speaking on uh, the, what I would call the global food fight. My talk is titled Navigating the Global Food Fight, Trade, Food Security, and the Battle for Policy Space. And I just want to make sure my slides are up here when I start. 
Okay, so there is a, as you may know, there's been a long standing debate on the question of whether trade supports or undermines food security. The issue has been debated since uh, the Corn Laws in, in Britain in the early 1800s and recently has come to the fore again following the 2007-8 food crisis that saw huge increases in food prices, hunger and riots around the world. The issue has also brought the World Trade Organization to its knees as countries like India and other developing countries have been fighting for what they call policy space in trade rules to enable them to pursue the kind of food security policies they feel are important for national food security while other countries, namely uh, rich industrialized countries, have pushed for further trade liberalization and the result has been a stalemate and a heated standoff in policy making. So although we see uh, President of the US, Obama, and uh, the Indian uh, Prime Minister Modi here uh, laughing and smiling as they're shaking hands, there's tension underlying this relationship. So what I want to talk about today is, is what's at stake and why it matters. So first, what's at stake here? For many developing countries, the impact of trade on food security is extremely important. There are around 800 million people in the world today who are chronically undernourished. And I just put the definition of chronic undernourishment at the bottom of the slide here because not everybody always understands the intricate details of what it means, but it basically means a caloric intake below what is needed uh, for a, even a sedentary lifestyle continuously for over a year. In other words, extreme chronic undernourishment. So 800 million people are in this situation and as you can see on the map here the distribution over 200 million reside in Africa and over 200 million reside in South Asia and in many of the countries experiencing this chronic undernourishment around 30 to 50 percent of their populations are actually in this in this condition so trade matters and trade rules matter for international food security just some more facts to give some background Around one third of the world's population is actively engaged in agricultural work. That's 2.5 billion people. Many of us are not farmers ourselves, but when we look in many developing countries, we see a high proportion of the population directly engaged in agriculture. So how we decide the rules at the international level to determine trade and food, it matters for many people. Most of the world's poor people also live in rural areas. The latest statistics say that around 70% of the world's poorest people live in rural areas, which is ironic because many of the most food insecure people in the world are actually farmers themselves. And we're also seeing a growing dependence on food imports in particular in some of the world's poorest countries. A recent uh, depiction of food import dependence taken from an, a recent UNCTAD report shows that Many countries, particularly when we look at Sub-Saharan Africa, are severely dependent on food imports. And the, even this map, which replaced one I was using from even a few years ago, has shown some important shifts. Food import dependence has become more stark in Sub-Saharan Africa, and we've seen places like China slip into the food import dependence category. Meanwhile, uh, world food trade has been growing dramatically. Since 2000 alone, we've seen a tripling in international trade in food and agriculture. But it begs an important question, and coming back to the big question, does trade support or undermine food security? And it's a complex question. The answer isn't always clear. Some, for some, it might enhance their food security. For others, it might not. Different countries and different constituencies are affected differently, and the, deba the debate sees competing ideas and powerful interests collide. So not surprisingly, policy at the international level to deal with this issue is highly contested. So the aim of my talk today is really to explore why it is that policy making on trade and food security is so difficult and how we might work towards more constructive dialogue towards policy space. And by policy space, what I'm talking about here is flexibility within international trade rules to allow countries to pursue food security programs that they feel they need for their domestic constituencies while at the same time being able to be sure that it's not harming other countries uh, by doing so. And this is, this is the tricky thing. So I'd like to make three points in the uh, probably 25 minutes that I have left. Uh, 
the first point I want to make, and make passionately, is that the debate right now is too binary. There are two sides to this question, and I would argue that both sides have strengths, but also weaknesses. So my point of this talk is not to advocate one worldview over another on this particular question, but rather to say we need to reject the binary nature of the debate and get our hands dirty into some difficult and messy issues. This is the part of the talk where I might lose some friends. <laughs> I have lots of friends on both sides of the debate, and uh, they might be disappointed that I'm choosing a middle ground, but I feel passionately that that's the place where uh, we need to go. The second point I want to make is that there are huge challenges to charting the middle ground. And there are complicated reasons for this. There's divisive rhetoric, fragmented institutions, and powerful interests. This is, this is my uh, political science uh, scientist coming out. This is the somewhat depressing political analysis portion of the talk. Uh, and third, uh, I want to suggest some ways in which we might transcend the impasse to carve out meaningful policy space. And this is where I hope to offer some hope for the future. Okay, so turning to the debate. I want to talk a little bit about the two sides of the debate so that you get an understanding and a flavor for what the, the binary nature of the debate is. Now, both advocates and critics of trade have con constructed narratives that they use and they draw on theory and practice to build these narratives, one seeing trade as an opportunity for food security and the other seeing trade as a threat. So I'll briefly outline their positions, starting with the trade as opportunity narrative, as de depicted on the slide here. Three interrelated arguments are typically put forward uh, in this particular narrative. The first is that trade will enhance food production. And this argument is based on ideas of comparative advantage, which draw on classical economic thinking, go dating back to David Ricardo in 1817 when he first outlined his theory of comparative advantage. But these ideas are still used regularly and widely today to defend trade and its uh, opportunity for food security. And the basic argument that Ricardo put forward and that is used today in these, in these uh, debates is, and I should say, I've tried to depict here, and I can't obviously go through all of the, the uh, bits of the slide in great detail, but just to say there are some simple components to this notion. David Ricardo basically argued that all countries are endowed with different uh, uh, labor, natural resources, and technologies, and based on those endowments, different countries have different opportunity costs for producing different goods. So if all countries, he argued, produced the goods that they were relatively best at producing and then traded with each other, everybody would be better off in the end. And so the argument, uh, the steps of the argument is that countries specialize in what they're relatively most efficient at producing. This more efficient production leads to economic growth. This leads to greater supply. This then leads to greater access. And so the argument would taking it to its logical conclusion is that some countries might be relatively better at producing grain, others might be, be relatively better at producing coffee, other countries might be relatively better at producing television sets. But the point is that if all countries specialize in what they're relatively best at producing and then trade with each other, we'll all be better off including with respect to food security. So this has been a foundational uh, theoretical idea that has really uh, been a cornerstone of this trade as opportunity perspective. But there are other arguments as well. Many economists today argue that trade improves food distribution. And this, again, um, may seem quite logical, that if we see some countries being better at producing food than others, of course it makes sense that if we want everyone to have access to food, we need to be able to move food around the world. And so food trade moves food from Def surplus areas to deficit areas. And many argue today that this is imperative in an era of climate change, as we're seeing certain regions of the world, in particular Sub-Saharan Africa, set to have its agricultural productivity decline as a result of climate change. It will need to import food, and we will need to have food trade to facilitate this. And so the graphic I put up here shows, this is the world uh, trade in grain and oil seeds, and shows that certain parts of the world, such as Brazil, North America, are quite uh, efficient at producing grains and oil seeds, and they can trade with other parts of the world that are less sufficient in those grains. 
And a third key argument in this particular narrative is that market distortions harm food security. So what do I mean by market distortions? These are policies that might restrict trade. Policies such as subsidies, where governments make payments uh, to their farmers, or policies where farmers, or sorry, where governments are erecting trade barriers, such as export restrictions or tariffs. And the argument runs along the lines that these kinds of interventions in the marketplace uh, result in inefficiencies, which in the end restrict access to food. So subsidies, for example, uh, in one part of the world, let's take the US as an example, which has enormous subsidies for its farmers, that can provide an unfair advantage to US exporters, for example, because they can sell their products at a lower price, and that can undercut farmers uh, in developing world. Or export bans, when happened in the food crisis, uh, as, the, as the blue graphic with a peak here shows, these are instances when countries such as India and other countries erected restrictions on exports of rice, and that bid up the price of rice on world markets, which made it really hard for other countries that were import dependent, such as in Sub-Saharan Africa, to uh, be able to obtain rice because the price had shot through the roof. So, Overall, then, this narrative tends to argue that freer trade has a most, on balance, a positive impact for food security, and therefore, if we want to promote food security in the world, we should do so with a free, within a free and open trading system, and they argue that the international rules should facilitate this. But, uh, as I've already alluded, that's only one part of the picture. An opposite narrative, what I would call the trade as threat narrative, sees things very differently. For those coming from this other narrative, this counter-narrative of trade as a threat, trade is seen to threaten not just the sovereignty of states, but also self-reliance of communities. So states are often asserting that it's a matter of national security, that they should be allowed and have the right to be self-reliant in food. It's risky for states to rely on other states for their food supply, and therefore, they argue, it's their sovereign right to be able to determine their own food policies, whether or not it involves restricting trade. And in terms of social movements, there's also strong affinity to this argument, where they argue to get the WTO out of agriculture and stress the priority of local food systems over the global food system. In other words, they argue that communities should be able to decide whether they would like to grow food for themselves or whether it should be exported. A second argument often made in the trade as threat narrative is that trade discounts the broader social and ecological roles of agriculture. We all know that uh, we, you know, we can think of agriculture as an economic activity where we're trading food commodities, but there's so much more to agriculture than just this one component. Agriculture provides uh, food security, ecological services, livelihoods, rural landscapes, culture and identity, and more. And many from this narrative argue that these other aspects of agriculture beyond tradable commodities should be seen as public goods. And it's not always clear that the marketplace will provide those services when they are not properly priced in the marketplace. They're not arguing to price those goods in the marketplace, but rather they're saying we should treat food differently and see it not as just a, a tradable commodity. And to quote Wolfgang Sachs on this point, he said, agriculture is not a normal business, and at the same time, it is much more than a business. And so the argument here is that when we're only talking about trade, we're missing this broader aspect of agriculture and we should not trade it away. A third key argument in the trade as threat narrative argues that food trade, especially liberalized food trade in, in an export-oriented industrial agriculture model brings enormous risks. It can undermine livelihoods, autonomy, land rights, and small farmers land rights of small farmers. This is a picture of a Kenyan woman who is involved in production of pineapples for export. When we consider the kinds of constraints that she as a farmer faces, it's easy to see what some of these concerns are. She faces fickle international markets where it's not always clear that she'll be able to sell the pineapples that she grows. She will have to follow strict regimens with respect to uh, how she plants the pineapples, what kind of chemical treatments, how they're harvested, and all kinds of other technical standards. Or she might lose 
for markets. And those standards, I should stress, are often set by the transnational corporations that are uh, running the, the trade in the pineapples. And when large-scale industrial agri agricultural export operations come in, they're often owned by foreign investors who then grab land. Uh, and workers, or farmers rather, might then become workers, uh, not owning their own land. So there are huge risks here that many people are concerned about. But there's also the, the cost of industrial agriculture in terms of its ecological costs. Growing research is showing that industrial export-oriented agriculture is directly linked to a decline in ecological diversity where we're seeing a much more narrow genetic base of our international agricultural system. And industrial agriculture is now increasingly being associated with climate change and some 30 to 50% of global greenhouse gases are associated with industrial agriculture. And additionally, there are also risks from being reliant on just a few uh, sources for foreign food. And this is an important one that we don't often hear about, but when we look at the statistics, they're quite striking. When we look at rice, maize, and wheat, some of the most traded commodities, we see that a huge proportion of those crops are being exported by a handful of countries. 85% of the world's rice trade is controlled by just five countries. 84% of the world's maize trade comes from just five countries, and 63% of the world's wheat comes from just five countries. So reliance on just a few sources can lead to vulnerability, especially when there's disruption in, in supply or in prices. So for this reason, trade critics call for a stronger role for states and for communities to shield agriculture from the negative effects of trade, and they call for greater self-reliance. Recent months, Bolivia, in fact, announced a move to go towards 100% food self-sufficiency. So there are these two sides of these debates. I would argue they both make good points, but I also want to stress that they both have weaknesses. And those weaknesses are not always acknowledged by the sides that are, are advocating their particular point of view. I'm just going to give a few examples because I don't have time to go into them in great depth, but I just want to raise a few key points. I would, I would say one of the biggest weaknesses of the trade as opportunity narrative is simply that in today's world, this ideal of comparative advantage that David Ricardo mapped out in 1817 doesn't really have a lot of relevance. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of relevance today because what Ricardo was talking about was a world where there were two countries, they were trading two goods, and uh, capital was not mobile between countries, only goods were traded between countries. But today, we, what we see in the global food system is a really huge and complex series of global value chains where, and I've put a value chain across the bottom of the slide here so you can see running from inputs to seeds to production uh, to processing to trade to retail and consumption. And transnational corporations control each one of those steps in these supply chains. And it's not just that transnational corporations are mobile across borders, which renders comparative advantage somewhat meaningless. They're also controlled by relatively few corporations at each stage of the supply chain. So for example, in the trade in basic grains, what we see is that just four companies, the ABCD companies, the Archer Daniels, Midland, Bungie, Cargill, and Louis-Dreyfus, control over 70% of the grain trade. Now, economists themselves even argue that when, when uh, markets are concentrated to this degree, efficiencies are out of the question. In other words, it's highly inefficient. And so even on their own terms, this particular argument is very weak. And there's concentration at other steps as well. You may have heard of the recent mega mergers in the agricultural input industry in recent weeks, where we've, what we're seeing is a transformation of, of the seed and uh, chemical sectors where we're going to be going from around six companies that control the bulk of that industry down to about three. Again, this kind of concentration wipes out any efficiency gains and is hugely problematic. So many argue that what we see in the food system is more like, is like an hourglass where you've got producers on one side and consumers on the other. And in the narrow part in the middle, very few transnational corporations that are controlling and calling the shots. This is not an efficient system that's necessarily going to bring benefits for all. It's going to bring benefits for those who hold the balance of power, and in this case, largely the transnational corporations. 
Environmental externalities are also assumed out of the theory of comparative advantage, and they really matter. They need to be brought back in. This is a picture from Indonesia. It's, it's a palm oil field that has been uh, cut down. What we see in this instance is not just enormous deforestation and greenhouse gases resulting from an export uh, oriented agricultural production, such as palm oil, but we're also seeing ecological hotspots where when there's a case where there's just a few countries that specialize in a particular good that's traded internationally, they are the countries that feel the effects the most. So what we see in this case is just three countries produce over 90% of the world's palm oil. And in this case, where we've got Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, and Thailand, they are experiencing the worst of the land degradation from forest conversion and uh, forest loss. So the impact here is enormous and concentrated. But it's not just the production of palm oil that causes externalities. I would be remiss not to also mention the consumption of palm oil. Palm oil is one of the fastest growing oils in processed and packaged foods, and processed and packaged foods is one of the fastest growing segments in international trade in food. And so the health effects from eating these kind of goods is also, we should consider, an externality. So it's hard to see trade as being beneficial for either the producers or the consumers uh, in this particular instance. But on the other side, the uh, trade as threat narrative also has some weaknesses that we need to acknowledge. First off, though many on the trade as threat narrative tend to argue for self-sufficiency in food, it's not really a feasible goal for all countries. This needs to be addressed and there's growing amount of research in the ecological sciences showing that there are land, water, and soil constraints in many countries. And some estimates say that around 66 countries have already passed their ecological boundaries and are unable to be self-sufficient in food. Those countries will need to rely on trade to some extent to meet their food security needs. And they, are, and they argue that if these countries do try to produce all of their own food, it could cause an even worse ecological impact because it could lead to more conversion of land to agriculture, more irrigation, more deforestation. So it's a tricky issue that we can't just say all countries should be food self-sufficient. It's not really feasible. And another critique that we need to really come to grips with is that not all farmers want to grow food. Some farmers do want to grow export crops. They find that for them, uh, it makes sense. Uh, and this is linked to a whole host of reasons. Sometimes there's prestige in growing export crops, but sometimes, especially with tree crops like coffee, like this Colombian coffee farmer, it takes years, if not decades, to build up a farm, uh, especially with tree crops, to be able to enter into these markets, and switching over to food crops overnight is not necessarily feasible. And so there, just to, to sum up this section of the talk, there are no easy answers to this question. There are some good points, but also some weak points in both sides of the narrative. But my point here, as I said, was not to argue one side or the other. It's to say the debate is too binary, and there's lots of gray area in between, and that's where we need to go. So this brings me to the second point that I really want to make, which is that there are, are challenges to charting the middle ground in policy sense. So I would say that given the strengths and weaknesses of the two sides of the debate that I've just outlined, there should be, in theory, uh, plenty of scope for reaching a middle ground consensus. If we, if, if we can say these are logical, clear arguments, they're backed up by scientific evidence, we, can sh we surely should be able to sit down, roll up our sleeves, and come up with some policy solutions. And here we might be able to craft this policy space this, that's been elusive in the WTO, for example. But the policy context has remained contentious. And I should stress here that this is despite the fact that when the, when the World Trade Organization launched the Doha Round in 2001, it actually mandated, right in the, in the declaration, it mandated the members of the World Trade Organization to work this particular issue out. It mandated them to come up with feasible solutions to create policy space for developing countries to protect the environment and to protect food security within the realm of the trade rules. And it's not as if developing countries haven't been trying. 
Uh, for example, in 2012, India has uh, passed a Food Security Act at the national level that it felt was going towards building some policy space for itself. This National Food Security Act called for public stockholding programs whereby the Indian government would buy grain at a certain price from some of its poorest farmers, hold that grain in storage, and then sell it to the poorest consumers at a subsidized price. The idea here was that the Indian government would have a food security policy that it felt could address its own food insecurity issues at home, and it felt strongly that these were, should be allowed within international trade rules. And this is important for India. Around 15% of India's population is chronically undernourished. And as I already mentioned, over 200 million people in India are in this situation. But the Western countries did not like what India did in its own domestic policy, and in fact accused India of passing a national act that is in contravention of the WTO rules because they said it constitutes a subsidy that distorts trade. The Group of 33, which is another group of developing countries headed up by India and Indonesia, has also been calling for policy space within the context of the World Trade Organization rules. It has asked for a special safeguard mechanism within the rules to allow it to protect itself when surges of imports come in from other countries that damage the staple grains that their own farmers produce. But in each of these cases, the rich industrialized countries have dug in their heels and have not acquiesced. And I've just got my five minute warning, so I'm gonna to have to speed up here a little bit. Okay, so there are three big challenges that help to explain why this debate has spun its wheels for the past 15 years, and I will go through these uh, fairly quickly. But I think they're important. The first, uh, the polarized nature of the debate. I've already talked about the two sides in terms of their substance, but what's really interesting to me when we study this debate is we see that there are differences, important differences in the way that they communicate as well. So there are different ideological traditions represented in these two worldviews, and they're based on different values, different language, and different goals. So the two pictures here, we see uh, Mr. Clemens Boonkamp, who was the head of agricultural trade at the World Trade Organization until recently, and on the other side, uh, Vandana Shiva, an international activist working on uh, peasant rights. And when we examine the kinds of speeches and writings that they put forward, we see different sets of words that they're using. So for example, it's not surprising, I suppose, economists will talk about markets, efficiency, crop yields, labor productivity, and incentives. Whereas on the other side, uh, activists are talking in language of community, sovereignty, resilience, livelihoods, and rights. And so when what we see is this kind of talking past each other kind of uh, dialogue where maybe the two sides aren't really understanding what the other is saying. But there's also different types of scientific data that each side considers legitimate. Those coming from the trade as opportunity narrative, typically tending to come from neoclassical economics, tend to like quantitative data to support their perspectives. Whereas those on the other side, coming from a range of other disciplines, are often using quanti qualitative case studies and exper lived experiences and stories to tell their side of the perspective. Both sides consider their evidence to be solid, but the other side does not respect the other one's evidence. But there's also common strategies on both sides that reinforce this polarization. Both sides of the debate tend to draw on long-standing ideas and historical norms that attach to their worldview. So on the one hand, efficiency is a very strong ideal, and so is sovereignty, and they're appealing to these different ideas. Both sides tend to oversimplify the other, and this I found in doing some of my own work with the FAO and, and doing a paper for them outlining these narratives. It was quite interesting that uh, those advocating uh, free trade tends to say that the other side is advocating complete self-sufficiency and vice versa, and neither is actually true. And both sides use what I would say polarizing rhetorical devices uh, to basically describe the other. So they often say that the other argument is going to result in perverse out outcomes, it's futile, it will never work, or it will jeopardize past risks. This draws on Albert Hirschman's work uh, on this particular topic, and he argued that these kind of strategies shut down meaningful dialogue. 
A second key challenge is institutional fragmentation. And I will have to really be quick here, I'm sorry, but just to point out, what we're seeing in terms of the, the governance of this issue of trade and food security, it's not really clear who's in charge of governing here. We've got the World Trade Organization on one hand, devising trade rules and advocating for open and free trade, but it's not a food security organization. At the same time, the UN has recently reformed its Committee on World Food Security, which is an open and participatory process, but it's actively discouraged from even talking about trade. Meanwhile, we got the UN uh, Food and Agriculture Organization trying to come up with meaningful studies. This is the recent uh, State of Commodities report on the theme of trade and food security, and I was lucky to have been invited to take part in the, the consultations that led to this report. But the organization mainly studies issues and doesn't have a lot of rulemaking authority. So we're left with a fragmented governance arena, and it's not clear where the rules should be set. A third key challenge are the powerful interests that are digging in their heels. What we see is a situation where rich industrialized countries enjoy enormous policy space for their own agricultural sectors. This is something they negotiated in past trade agreements, but now at this moment, they are resisting giving developing countries equal space. So we're having a stalemate at the WTO and it's not very pleasant. Meanwhile, others such as the food sovereignty movement from civil society are even refusing to come to the table. And there's a risk right now, the Nairobi ministerial for the WTO happened back in December 2015. There's a risk that they are now going to drop food security altogether from international trade negotiations, which could be a shame because the whole mandate to deal with this issue could be dropped along with it. So transcending the impasse, what can be done? This is where I hope to offer a bit of hope uh, and Hope, and, and we'll be able to talk about this in the question period if I run out of time. Um, but I just want to point out three strategies in particular. And these draw in immediately from uh, the analysis that I've given. But first, I think we need to shift ideas. We need to move to more nuanced understandings and forge new norms to get away from the binary arguments. And one way to do that is to open, ask more open-ended questions. So rather than asking is trade good or bad for food security, we should be asking under what circumstances can trade be helpful, under what circumstances can it be harmful, and how do we reach balance in the policy space. And asking questions in this way can help us to think along a continuum rather than within a binary. And we can also embrace complexity and nuance. I didn't put this crazy slide up here to expect you to read it. I just wanted you to see that it was a crazy slide. This slide came out of the report that I showed earlier, and it came out of an exercise of a consultation where experts around the room wanted to map out in what ways can trade be helpful, in what ways can trade be harmful, and also in the short run versus the long run. And what you get when you come up with a really complicated matrix like that is a better understanding of how different countries facing different situations are going to be affected by trade in different ways. And once we understand those different ways, we can come up with more flexible policies to allow countries to pursue policies that best suit their needs while also minimizing harm to others. The second strategy is simply to improve institutional coordination. We need to let the Committee on World Food Security talk about trade. We need to let the, make sure that the WTO doesn't drop food from its discussions. And we need the FAO to work more closely with these two organizations. This picture here of Azevedo and De Silva, the heads of the World Trade Organization and the FAO uh, respectively, was snapped shortly after the uh, FAO started to conduct its study on trade and food security when the World Trade Organization got wind of the fact that the FAO was uh, looking at this issue and didn't want to be left out. They immediately got a uh, photo opportunity here, but it's good to bring these two people together to think about this in a joint way. But also I would argue we need more civil society participation in these forums more generally. And third, I know this is the hugest, uh, hugest thing, but we need to tame uh, powerful interests. But I do firmly believe that we can do that if we achieve uh, the other strategies. So for example, if we insist upon transparent and participatory negotiations, we can work towards better outcomes. That we can broker compromise through better institutional coordination, and we can shift interest through the power of new ideas and new ways of thinking about these issues.
So rather than just having the G7 here that were in Japan last week sitting around the table at their working lunch, uh, the table should be a lot bigger and a lot more open. So just to conclude, I want to leave you with a quote that I found in the course of my research that I thought was particularly apt. Uh, though it's a historical quote, I think it's good for the debates today. Uh, as so often in economic debates between two alternatives, history provides the answers which economists abhor. Both. Uh, Charles Kinderberger said this in 1975, and I think it's very appropriate today. Trade is neither a panacea nor is it a threat, but it does pose challenges that need to be managed. And I would argue that in navigating the global food fight, we must learn from history and practice around trade and food security to come up with new ways of thinking. And we need to use the power of those new ideas to change political process and shift entrenched interests towards more constructive policy dialogue. And so with that, I say thank you. Well, thanks uh, very much, Jennifer, for a, a really comprehensive presentation and, uh, and allowing us to imagine what both might look like. So that's uh, very exciting. We now have an opportunity to uh, pose questions uh, to Professor Clapp. Uh, please use the microphones on either side of uh, the uh, auditorium. Uh, vous pouvez poser vos questions ou en anglais ou en français, évidemment. Uh, please uh, say who you are and... Uh, Ask questions of an interrogatory nature, if you would. Please. While we're waiting for people to come forward, um, I think that uh, one of the interesting things for me in all of this is that picture of the, the pineapple was very powerful for me uh, because it also engages questions around food safety which are hugely important in not only the Canadian context, but I've just come from China before being here, and of course that's a country that's preoccupied with food safety. I'm curious as to whether or not your research helps us understand how food safety is both, of course, an important issue, but how it also can be deployed as a mechanism of uh, protectionism, especially for countries like Canada or the Europeans, et cetera. Right, that's, that's a really good question, and it's one where uh, we're seeing much more research being conducted right now in these ways in which uh, technical standards can uh, both facilitate uh, trade but also uh, cause barriers. Uh, so it can facilitate trade by the fact that um, big retail chains, for example, might be much more likely to import pineapples from Kenya, provided they meet a set of technical specifications. But if the farmers growing those pineapples can't afford to meet those specifications, they're going to be uh, squeezed out of the market. And that's a concern where, we're, where we're, what we're seeing is large-scale operations that can meet those kind of standards are tending to be able now to buy up tracts of land, uh, operate plantations so that they can meet those standards. But what it does is it sort of takes those farmers who used to be more autonomous and self uh, directed and makes them into either unemployed or um, plantation workers, which raises a whole other set of issues. And yeah, that question of who bears the cost of meeting those standards, I think, is very, very important. And I would only add that it's not only the corporate interests that are demanding this, it's consumer interests as well. So, I mean, each of us making our own choices about what we privilege as we choose food has a direct impact on what's available in terms of land use, et cetera, in developing countries. Oh, exactly. So if we walk into the supermarket and expect to have uh, you know, pineapples without pesticide residue or of a certain size or of a certain ripeness, then we have to understand, I would call that distance in the system, that we don't understand always what that means uh, at the other end. Uh, but part of the problem is that in that place where we don't understand always what's going on, is certain actors have more power than others. And so the big retail chains that are buying the pineapples, for example, they, they can ensure that the cost and the liability is pushed down the line. Uh, because if, for example, somebody buys a pineapple and it has uh, a high level of pesticide residue and they get sick, they're going to want to to sue the first person they see, which is the supermarket. But the supermarket has already worked it out. 
uh, that, the, that the buck stops far down the line and not, not with them. And so these standards, they can bring some positive aspects such as food safety and, and assurance for consumers, but they also have some negative effects for those uh, growing the food. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Brooke. I'm a graduate student at the University of Ottawa. Um, I'm coming back to this issue of powerful interests. And you both touched a little bit on the notion, quite a bit actually, on the corporate aspect behind it. Um, so I'm thinking about TNCs as they merge in this, this um, growing influence that they have and getting back to this notion of how consumers have the ability to kind of shape um, the corporate world in a sense by what they choose to take off the shelves. But going further back and saying, you know, when these corporate interests and their, uh, their influence increases to the point where they can be at the table for negotiations, for trade agreements, that allow for uh, us to not have country of origin labeling on meats and lack of information around GMOs and other things where that affects consumer literacy. Um, how do we get to the bottom of taming these powerful interests and who needs to be at the table um, to help kind of wrangle big food and big beverage that's going in and having this kind of influence, not just you know in terms of creating the US food pyramid and whatnot, but actually impacting trade agreements. Right, thank you. Yeah, there's lots of layers in your question, but I think uh, a big part of the problem is, is the corporate concentration that we're seeing right now, where um, even in the retail sector and the big food processors, as, as you're saying, there's just a handful of companies that are controlling much of what is being produced, traded, uh, and consumed around the world. And so in some ways, we can say government should be doing more, and I really think strongly they should be doing more to really scrutinize these kinds of mergers and acquisitions that are going on. They're going on like crazy right now um, with all kinds of financial pressures in the financial world where investors are wanting better returns. They're pushing their companies to merge and become fewer companies that are bigger. Now, the problem with that is political. When you have fewer countries that are bigger, companies that are bigger, they don't just, uh, you know, have issues with efficiency, they're not just inefficient, they're also politically more powerful. We have fewer opportunities than for others to come in and, and lobby in that space because the big guys are basically taking up all of the government's ear in terms of setting regulations. So there's like almost like this weird iterative process then when if we allow the economic forces to become so concentrated, they also become politically very, very powerful. And so that's where, again, I think there's, there's the, there is power in thinking about legal frameworks where we can come up with better rules to prevent those kind of things from happening. Uh, where we could have, for example, an international agreement that deals with uh, corporate competition. Like it, I don't think it's that uh, out of line. Uh, we have the World Trade Organization. That's also a problem because even though it's a place where we have one country, one vote, in theory, making the rules and a consensus-based organization, which sounds nice, all of those negotiations take place behind closed doors. Other, uh, even other international organizations aren't even allowed to observe what goes on in those negotiations. And so we tend to sort of hear about it once it's done. And the irony is that the World Trade Organization, as untransparent as it is, is far better than some of the other arenas in which trade agreements are being negotiated, like the TPP and the TTIP which are very untransparent and secretive. So how, you know, how we grapple with that, I think we need, as a global community, we need to demand more transparency and more participation in these kinds of processes so that we can set legal frameworks that are in the public good and not just in the corporate good. I'm going to apologize in advance that we may not get to all of the questions where people are lined up. I apologize because we have to end so that other events can continue. Let's move over here, and I would ask you to try to be as brief as possible. Thank you. Sure. Thanks very much, uh, Sarah Martin from Memorial University of Newfoundland. Jennifer, thanks for a great talk. It's a really difficult, complex topic, and you made it really um, easy for us to understand. So thanks very much. My question is about the question of ideas. So the IMF recently is coming out with reports that seem to go against past ideas around structural adjustment and certain kind of policies. What are the kind of ideas that you might be, what are the lights or ideas that you see at the I, or FAO or possibly the WTO um, that, that you think potentially could be leveraged? Thanks very much. 
Thanks, Sarah. Great, great question. Um, as I was rereading the overall report that the FAO put out, I was really delighted um, to see some of those ideas starting to shift. So Sarah is no doubt mentioning the IMF came out with a report last week questioning neoliberalism. Like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so you keep pushing on those ideas, eventually they end up in the title of an IMF report. That's exciting. Um, but in the FAO report, I also saw some exciting things where there was acknowledgement that corporate concentration is problematic uh, in the food system. So in the course of, of the consultations I took part in with many economists around the table, and I was sort of the political economist, I don't know what I was, um, I heard arguments that, oh, corporate concentration is not a problem because it reduces transaction costs in the sector to have fewer players. And I'm like, really? Um, <laughs> that's interesting. But, but the report actually made the opposite argument. So for me, that's one of those hinging points where um, the ideas and how they get expressed and how they get taken up are really, really important for shifting the debate. So it may seem that for years, uh, critics are making the same argument, the same kind of critique about something that's bothering them, in this case, corporate concentration, and suddenly we see a little shift, and then a whole, um, you could see a whole of floodgates open and things could be looked at very differently. And that's a simple and normal part of norm shift and norm change. It can seem glacial at times, but at other times it can be rushing. And it, so it can be very exciting, and I think that we shouldn't let go of this notion that ideas can change uh, institutional practice and that they can change uh, power, the way powerful interests perceive their own uh, place in the game. Thanks. You were next. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Megan. I'm an undergraduate at Mount Royal. Uh, I recently took a course called Economic Development and Social Change. And so one of the biggest questions in that course was why are some countries like Mexico uh, having their greatest import as or export as tomatoes or agriculture and then countries like the US having uh, airplanes and these really kind of uh, technological exports. And so I was just wondering what you kind of thought about that. Uh, we, we spoke a lot about indigenous capitalism and not developing <coughs> backward and forward links uh, and just kind of how colonialism contributed to how markets operate now. So I just wanted to know what your thoughts were on that question. Thank right. you. Okay, that's a huge question. It's a, huge a big question. one. <laughs> But just, I mean, just to say that, I mean, yes, historical um, trajectories are very important for the, for the kind of goods that countries tend to uh, specialize in. But just to take your example of Mexico, which I think is a really interesting one, um, where Mexico, since NAFTA, has become a big exporter of fresh fruits and vegetables and a big importer of maize. And Mexico used to produce uh, more of its own maize, uh, but now it imports it from the United States. And it was, they were told under the NAFTA arrangement that this would be more efficient and they would be better off because they could earn more money selling tomatoes and use the money and the profits to buy uh, maize instead. But that raises all kinds of questions around uh, viable livelihoods, uh, sovereignty, uh, and et cetera, that Mexicans need to really think about. Uh, do they want to be part of a bigger uh, global efficiency game, or do they want to think about their own national uh, self-sufficiency? So it's, it's, it's a tricky question because it's, it's steeped in history, as you say, but also the broader geopolitics of the region. So I don't have enough time to get into it because Stephen's going to uh, yank on me in a second, but I think it's, a, it's an important question, but you have to look at each country in, in its specificity. And I'm really sorry, but I've been told that we've completely run out of time, so I'm going to have to uh, conclude with that. I do apologize for the two of you who've been waiting uh, for a while, but um, I do want to note that the big thinking events are all videotaped, so I can uh, invite you to look at uh, Jennifer and other comments l later at congress2016.ca. Um, if you're interested in purchasing one of uh, Dr. Clapp's books, You'll have an opportunity outside the theater now because uh, she'll be holding a book signing in the CIBC hub room, which is just by the main entrance, the CIBC hub room. So please uh, join us there. And join me, uh, encore une fois, à dire un grand remerciement à Jennifer pour un discours très intéressant et uh, important. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much.